Good evening all and welcome. Relationships are great. Happy, bliss. That is until of course it all goes wrong. And they are the worst and creepiest people you've ever met when they show a far darker side of them than you ever knew. I would also like to thank Miss Fearsome for joining us in tonight's video. If you enjoy her narrations, feel free to check her out when the video is over or at any point really, link in the description and at the end. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I have been divorced for several years now, but not by choice. My now ex-wife Julia ended our marriage apparently out of the blue, citing claims of infidelity. There's just one problem. I never cheated on her. In fact, I was positively in love with her. My affections for her never dwindled in the least. I wasn't prone to spending a disproportionate amount of time at work or with friends, so I had given her no reason to think I was being unfaithful. Truthfully, she was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Unfortunately, it took a messy divorce for me to see her true colours. The divorce court judge believed her adultery allegations uncritically, giving her everything she needed to wreck me financially and leave me with nothing. I considered pursuing custody of our two children, but I dropped the case when she threatened to accuse me of child abuse and molestation. Once she made that threat, I knew I had no chance of winning. The family court judge would have believed her just as easily and unquestioningly as the divorce court judge. So now I'm living in a two-room apartment, needing to work two job to make ends meet, thanks to alimony and child support payments. And I get to see my son and daughter every third or fourth Saturday. And frankly, I'm fortunate it's even that frequent. She's interfered with my visitation rights multiple times with full backing of the courts, and I dare not protest should she try to play the molester card. Some months ago, she started allowing them to come over to my place every other weekend. That's when I began to notice some problems. My son had a bruise and cut on his arm. I asked him what happened, and he shrugged it off by saying that he got into a fight at school. The next time I saw them, my daughter also had a bruise, and she used the same excuse as my son. That's when I started to grow worried. Both of my kids getting into fights at school within a couple of weeks of each other. I mean, it's not impossible, but I never really bought it. Over the next few months, I began to notice other problems. Their clothing began to look worn and exceedingly dirty, and both of them had noticeably lost weight. This didn't make sense to me. My ex was getting more than enough money from me in terms of child support. There was no reason for my kids to be looking like this. I tried asking my son and daughter what was going on, but neither of them would say much. This raised some red flags. I couldn't afford a private investigator at that point, when fortunately a friend of mine who was far better off financially agreed to help me out. So I asked him to install a security camera for my apartment. When I asked why, I told him, something tells me I might be needing one soon. After a few weeks, the private detective met with me and my friend at my apartment, and the information he provided us was upsetting to say the least. He had numerous photographs of my ex meeting with shady characters in out-of-the-way places purchasing drugs. In some of the photos, my ex was shown walking out of shopping malls with new shoes and very expensive clothing. She had been using my child support checks for anything but supporting our children. The last two photos were taken from outside the house, and the detective got clear shots of my ex with raised fists while my children were in a defensive position and sobbing. So much for the claims that they were getting into fights at school. He told me one more thing, that my ex might have spotted him at one point or may have noticed him a little earlier and got suspicious, but he couldn't say for sure. Whatever the case, I had the dirt on this loathsome witch, and I was going to expose her. Later that same night, I was woken up by a persistent ringing on my doorbell. I stumbled to my front door and opened it up. It was my ex-wife. 
She looked like she was ready to shoot lasers from her eyes. If looks could kill, I would have died from a heart attack on the spot. But I kept my composure. What the hell do you want at this hour? You hired someone to follow me, didn't you? To take pictures of me? Oh, so you saw him, huh? I said, taking a measure of sadistic pleasure at making her realize she was screwed. What the hell did you do that for? I had my reasons. Whatever the case, I've got the goods on you. Your ass is going to prison, and you're never going to be seeing the kids again, not if I have anything to say about it. She stood there silent for a few seconds, her rage seething. If I can't have them, neither will you. Suddenly she pulled a knife. I reacted a little too late, and she stabbed me in the shoulder. I stumbled back into my apartment with her trying to plunge the knife deeper. I shook her off, but she took a slashing motion and got me in the arm, leaving an ugly gash. I grabbed my living room lamp and tossed it at her. It struck her in the head, and she was out cold. The police arrived, and I told them everything. My ex had regained consciousness by the time and tried to play the victim, saying that I was being rough with her and she only stabbed me in self-defense. I told the cops I had a security camera, and it would prove my side of the story. I knew I had made the right call having it installed. My ex got a pretty hefty prison sentence, combining her illicit drug use, neglect and physical abuse of the children, as well as her attempted murder of me. She would be old and grey by the time they let her out. I couldn't immediately take in my children due to previous financial ruin, but the court agreed to grant me full custody once I got back on my feet. For now, my kids are staying with my parents, but when the time comes, I look forward to rebuilding my relationship with them. When I was in high school, I lived in a really small town in Texas, and it was the kind of place where everyone was either related to each other or hated each other. I had no family there, but I did have a pretty blonde girlfriend, and was pretty hated for that too. Nothing major, just petty harassment, occasional fights, but it had been escalating. So that's why on Valentine's Day, my girlfriend and I decided to skip the school dance and just stay in and watch a movie at her house while her parents went out. We just thought it better to avoid any trouble. We borrowed her dad's car, a little Honda hatchback, and went into town to stop at the video store for a movie and at Dairy Queen for some ice cream. Now she lives in the complete boonies, out in the middle of the woods, along a lonely road with no street lights. And as we were driving along, chatting and eating our blizzards, all of a sudden a car came up behind us, which is no big deal initially. But what was a very big deal was that when the headlights flooded the interior of our car, I could see two hands on the back seat and a head coming from the hatchback part of the car. And as soon as the lights hit, the head and hands retreated back down. A solid chill ran through the entire length of my body as I slowly reached down and pulled out my pocket knife which was the only thing I had. My girlfriend noticed I'd done this and asked what was wrong. Nothing, I said. I just have to stop at my friend's house real quick. She knew I was lying. I didn't have any friends. I pulled over at the next house that came up and jumped out of the car, yelling at her to jump out too. She jumped out in total confusion as I flipped the driver's seat forward and lunged into the back seat in full maniac mode. He popped up like a jack-in-the-box with empty hands waving. Hey! Hey, what are y'all up to tonight? It was some weird kid from our high school who we had never in our entire lives spoken to before. Ever. I said, What in the holy hell are you doing in our car? I thought you guys were going to the dance and I was just hitching a ride, he replied. We sat there staring at him with our mouths wide open, wondering what to say or do. He tried to act cool as we were in the middle of nowhere, in some random person's driveway, so whatever he was planning was forgotten. We actually ended up driving him to the dance and dropping him off, with him telling us to come inside. Yeah, no thanks. 
We dropped his ass off and noped out of there as soon as we could. And as soon as he got out of the car, my girlfriend started crying and shaking. She was so freaked out. I have no idea what he was trying to do when the lights caught him crawling out of the hatchback. I hated that high school. This was three years ago, and I started college down the country. I was 18 and on Tinder and had never actually met anyone from it, but would just swipe through guys to be nosy and see who was on it. I was swiping right on some and about a half hour after, got a message from this guy, who according to his account, was roughly 20 kilometers away. We made some small talk, and it was awkward, and I stopped replying. A day later, I received a friend request for him from Facebook. Mind you, I have a common enough name, so it would have taken ages for him to find me. We had no mutual friends, and my Tinder photos are not on my Facebook page. The only thing I had on it was the university I was attending, so maybe that's how he found me, but I don't know. I then quickly got a follow request on Instagram, and he somehow found my Snapchat username. I don't even have my social media, and it's a variation of my full name with extra added vowels and an underscore. I was freaking out at this point. I messaged him asking how he found my full name, and he just replied, I think we have a connection. I really want to get to know you better. I unmatched him, deleted my Tinder, and blocked the accounts he tried to add me on all social media. After that, it was quiet for a few months. I was staying in digs and was knuckling down as I had a lot of assignments from the get-go. This was towards the end of November. I had no assignments due for two weeks, so I decided to go out with some friends. One of my friends stayed in student accommodation and the other was commuting, so she was staying with the other friend. I decided to walk back to my digs, as my landlady would probably freak out if I wasn't home that morning, and I really wish I got a taxi instead. I walked back and was about 15 minutes from the local nightclub we were at. It was at 3am, and I was at the front door of the house opening up. The door was annoying, as it had two different locks, and I had to pull the handle towards myself to help open it up. It's also tough when you're tipsy and trying not to wake up the family you're staying with. As I finally unlocked the door, a dark car pulls into the housing estate I'm staying in. It's quite big and has a big green area in the middle for children or people playing with their dogs. The car comes towards me, so I quickly get inside and lock the door. The car pulls into the driveway of the house I'm staying in and just sits there with the full headlights on. I'm there shaking and too afraid to move from crouched below the door as there's frosted glass about halfway up. As I get the courage to go upstairs and look out my bedroom window to see who it is, the car pulls out the driveway and speeds off. A few days later I get a new friend request off the creepy Tinder guy on a new Facebook profile, even though there were no pictures on the account, just the same name I blocked it. It was enough. It even caused me to transfer universities the next year. Thankfully, I haven't heard anything since. I don't know if it was just bad timing or if it was that creep on Tinder that sat in the driveway, but it was petrifying. If you take anything from this, be careful who you let on social media or dating apps and what information you have up. So I've never told anyone this story. Because how the hell do you admit to your family you were almost abducted when you were 11 years old? It was 2005 and a usual summer day for me. I got up about noon, went on a bike ride with my brother, then came home and spent most of the remaining daylight in our above ground pool. I was relaxing and intent on spending the rest of the night playing video games. I decided to check my MySpace profile really quickly and spend some of the energy on my games there. But as I was finishing off my Dog Wars energy bar and about to close the browser to head downstairs to play some PlayStation, I got a sudden friend request. Ali, 13, who was three hours away from nowhere, Kentucky. I clicked the name because I didn't know an Ali. 
not even an Allison, or really any girls whose name began with A. And she was pretty. Eleven-year-old me just scoffed. Why would she want to be friends with me? And I almost ignored it. Almost. I accepted the request, and with not much else to do, I sent her a message, asking a simple question like, should I know you from somewhere? She told me we'd not met, but that she was friends with one of my friends, Mike. I checked out her profile and saw that she and Mike had shared a lot of common interests and were on each other's friends list, so what she was saying checked out. I didn't message Mike to ask him about her, but I was a very trusting young boy and had no reason to believe she was anything but what she said she was. For the next few weeks I'd talk to her every night, for no less than three hours usually. We'd just chat about school, music, television, typical kid stuff, and I didn't really think anything about it, than just being MySpace friends. That is until she said that she liked me. I sort of laughed it off thinking she just meant like, in the way friends like each other, but she clarified that she meant she had feelings for me and wanted to meet me in person. She lived pretty far away from me, so I didn't really see how this would be possible. I knew my parents were not about to take me to some girl I'd met online, and quite honestly I wouldn't want them to. They were decent parents and all. I just never felt I could talk to them about these kinds of things, so I just sort of shrugged it off. I told her it'd be hard for us to meet, because as much as I like riding my bike, a three-hour bike ride to a part of the state I'd hardly even seen before was not something I'd be comfortable doing. She was very understanding and said that she at least wanted to talk on the phone, instead of just messaging. I agreed but told her never to call my number and to always let me be the one to call her, because I didn't want my parents picking up and asking questions. She understood so I called her. The first time I got her dad and he gave me a gruff, who is this? It was weird though, because I had the phone with me at the computer and told her I was calling, and she said she had the phone with her as well. But I didn't think anything of it and told him it was James and that I was looking for Ali. He told me to hold on a second, and there was a rustling sound on the phone, like someone trying to make it sound like they were handing it over. Again, I didn't really think anything of it, when then I heard a high-pitched, Hello? We talked for a few minutes, then she said she had to go because her dad was expecting a call as well. I shrugged it off and told her to just message me so we could talk again later. We kept messaging back and forth for a while, and before I knew it, it was almost the end of summer. She was unhappy still not having met me in person, so she posed an idea. She said there was an end of summer event going on at a lake near my house, and she said that her and her family used to go there sometimes, and that she could probably talk them into going there for the event. Now my family usually went to the area on the 4th of July, and having just had a nice time there, it wasn't too hard for me to convince my folks as well. A few nights later she let me know that they had agreed and that she was super excited to finally meet me. She told me she was going to kiss me as soon as she saw me, which made me blush, so I tried my best to make it sound like it wasn't a big deal, like I was some stud who'd kissed plenty of girls before, but I wasn't. I was totally pumped to finally kiss a girl, and it was only a few nights away. I had a hard time sleeping the next couple of nights, and I stayed up most of the night talking to Ali. We were both excited and couldn't wait to meet. It was very much a magical experience. The night before I think I stayed up until 8am talking to her. So the day had come, and after an early afternoon bike ride and a short swim, our family loaded into the car, and my dad took the truck so that me and my brother could take our bikes to the lake with us. There was plenty of bike trails and we always enjoyed riding there, but I told my brother I wasn't going to be hanging with him the whole night and would only ride with him a little bit before I went to meet another friend. He wanted to tag along like little brothers do, but I quickly convinced him he didn't want to hang out with me because the kids were mean and I was only hanging out with them because of one of them. He thankfully didn't ask any questions after that. About an hour later, 
and the sun was starting to set. My brother said he was going back to meet with our parents anyway, as he didn't like riding in the dark. He already had a habit of crashing as it was, so when I ventured off on my own, it was without hindrance. I made my way to the picnic area Ali had agreed to meet me at, and I sat on one of the tables with my bike, resting against the side. I sat for a long time, so long that I started to get worried and was ready to leave because the fireworks were about to start and Ali hadn't shown up yet. I stood up and jumped down from the picnic table, and just as I did, a rusty old white pickup truck pulled up beside the tables. The man inside reached across the cab to roll down the window and gave me a weird smile, telling me that he was Ali's dad and that he was going to take me to her. I started feeling strange about the situation, so I just gave him a blank stare and said, What? He turned the engine off thinking maybe I couldn't hear him over the sound of it and climbed out of the truck. I said I'm here to take you to Ali. Hop on in, he said, opening the passenger door and motioning for me to climb in. The truck was full of garbage and it looked very dirty. I could smell oil and other things coming from the truck as I gave a crooked look and told him I wasn't going to get in. As he grabbed my arm and pulled me towards the truck, I realised pretty quickly what he was all about. Get in the damn truck, he barked, squeezing my arm so tightly that I thought it was broken. I pulled away, practically giving myself an Indian burn as I told him I was leaving. But he came after me, so I did the only thing I could think to do to repel a grown man twice my size, and probably thrice my age. I reared back and kicked him square in the genitals. I didn't bother to wait to see how he'd handled the blow, and hopped on my bike, pedalling with all my might back to the other side of the lake where my family was. He didn't follow me. At least I don't think he did. And if he had, he might have seen my dad. He was a rather large guy, and definitely not someone you'd want to fight after he'd had a few beers. I never saw him again and when I got home and went to message Ali to tell her what a jerk her dad was, the profile was gone. I saw Mike just before school started, and he said he had no idea who Ali was, and didn't even remember adding her on MySpace. It wasn't until some years later that I realised how terribly close I'd come to being abducted, and God knows what that man wanted to do to me. Ali's dad, let's not meet again. A few years ago, I was on a dating site where I matched with a police officer. I thought his dog was cute and figured this was my opportunity to finally pet a canine police dog. I was quickly disinterested after listening to him complain about his recent divorce. I don't recall details, but I remember it was very apparent he was the problematic person in that relationship. I was also really grossed out by how he fetished me for my big sloppers, tattoos and colourful hair. I was very upfront and told him I wasn't interested and that he was giving off some red flags for me. He begged me to give him a second chance and I said no and blocked his number. A few days later, I get a knock on my door at around midnight. My heart dropped into my butt it startled me so much. I look up my peephole and see a stranger holding food. It's an Uber Eats delivery driver. I tell him through the door that I didn't order food, but he said someone else had ordered it and he knew my name. I asked who ordered it and he said a name I didn't recognize. I tell him I didn't want the food and gave him directions to the dumpster to throw the food out because at this point I have no idea if he is actually from Uber. Later on, I'm going through my dating app matches and realize it was the cop's name. I go through my blocked messages and this guy had texted me a lot. The last text was, I hope you like your dinner. I decided it was best to unblock this man so that I could keep an eye on what was going on in case I needed to be worried about my safety or if I'm going to need to buy some bear mace or drop a cop. A few weeks later while I'm at work, as I'm a hairstylist, I get a call from a number I didn't recognize. 
I answer as I assume it's a new client. A voice on the other line says, Hey Rachel, I'm at Starbucks across the street. What's your drink order? Who is this? I don't have you in my appointment book. Assuming it's a regular and I made a scheduling error. He says his name. And again, my heart drops to my butt. How does he know where I work? I ask him how does he know where I live and work, and he explains that he did a reverse image search on my photos from my dating app profile, found my social media and my Yelp page from my salon. Then, he looked up my address from there. I tell him I'm calling his station and reporting him for stalking, and if he ever comes near me again, I will consider it a threat and will be ready to physically defend myself. After all of that, he begs me to give him a chance. I hang up, call the police station he works at, as this is a very small town, and complain. They won't even let me email screenshots of my creepy texts. I could tell nothing would be done. The lady literally said, Oh, I'm so sorry. He's going through a lot right now, Bay. Literally treat him like he's the victim. He mostly left me alone after that, but I was so scared of living alone for the first time in my life. I have a semi-popular meme page on Instagram with about 8,000 followers. I sifted through and found like five of his accounts and blocked them all and moved on. This was several years ago, but all the memories came flooding back when I noticed a familiar profile photo on an account who commented on a post. I must have missed an account of his when blocking. I had posted a photo of me holding two big tuners I caught on a fishing trip and he commented, God, I wish I was one of those fish. I'd love to know what it was like to be held by you. Bath. Back in December of 2004. Doesn't seem real. It's been almost 10 years since I was living in Portland, Oregon, attending college, and I was sitting at home one night, writing my last research paper for the term. I had my Yahoo IM up and was chatting to a few friends, when a message from someone, not on my list, popped up. It read, Have you ever thought about suicide? Uh, okay, weird. But hey, it's almost midnight on a Sunday night, and stranger things have been asked to me before. So I messaged the stranger back, just for kicks. Sure, who hasn't at some point? Why? While well, asking that question opened Pandora's box. He battered me with questions about how I wanted to die, why did I want to die, would I want to die with others, etc., and was inevitably getting creepier and creepier as the conversation continued. But I played along, assuming the guy was just screwing around with me. I asked him his name, to which he said it was Jerry, and I asked to see a picture. He then sent me to a profile pic on Hot or Not and asked me if I thought he was good looking. I told him, sure, yeah, you're cute, whatever. He then asked to see a picture of me. So I sent him a random old photo of a girl on MySpace Friends. Yes, it's that old, I realise now. And he told me I looked ten. Awesome. Thanks, Jerry, who was obsessed with suicide. As the conversation continued... He told me how he was sick of life, and women don't ever seem to be attracted to him, so he wants to end it all. I told him the things you're supposed to say to people in this situation. Relationships are nothing. You're more important to the people in your life. Don't do it, blah blah blah. I'm not heartless, but I just didn't feel like talking someone off a ledge at that moment. It was 1am. Jerry then went on to tell me that he'd met a lot of women online that wanted to kill themselves and that he was planning a party for Valentine's Day, which was one and a half months away, so everyone can come and do it together at his house in Kalamath Falls, Oregon. He asked me if I was interested in joining. I said yeah, sure, but made an excuse that I didn't have a car to get down there for it. He told me there were a few women from Portland coming down for it, and one of them had a van, so he was sure I could catch a ride. He said he'd built a beam in his home that would hold up to 50 bodies at once, but that I shouldn't wear shoes because they'd weigh me down. By now, yes, I was starting to realise that this guy was actually very serious, and this was in fact not a joke. So I started asking him specifics like, 
what his address was, what his full name was, and who were the women travelling from Portland. He told me their names, and that one of them was bringing her five children with her, and that they wanted to die as well. Huge red flags are up at this point. So whilst I was still chatting with him, I called a friend of mine back in Eastern Oregon, who works as a 911 dispatcher. She was actually at work when I called, and after telling her the whole story, she advised me to hang up and call Portland Police Department right away, at least give them the info to pass to Klamath Falls. She made a record of it in her system that I'd called just in case. I kept talking to Jerry and called the Portland Police. They sent two officers out about an hour later, and they pretty much laughed at me when I explained to them what was going on. I printed out our chat log and gave them the guy's full name and address that I'd already verified through Google as being legit, as far as Google was concerned, and they told me to just quit talking to him. Simple as that, and they went about their business. Well, didn't I feel stupid? I called my friend back home and told her what Portland PD did, and she said to just keep an eye on things. If he keeps talking, just keep saving the conversation. So I did just that. Another two hours passed and things just got to the point where I couldn't handle him anymore. He was battering me with questions about how I wanted to die. Wearing clothes or naked? Do I want to have sex before I die? Would I have a problem killing kids beforehand? Would I want to hold hands with others while we hang? Finally, I just told him I'd be in touch closer to Valentine's Day. And for the most part, I just laughed it off with some friends. Because Portland PD never got back to me about anything so of course I assumed it ended up being a very strange prank. However, fast forward to February 10th, 2005, when a friend of mine called me whilst I was on campus on my way to work. He told me about some guy down in Klamath Falls that had been arrested for trying to set up a mass suicide pact for Valentine's Day. I was floored. I ran to my office, logged into a computer, and sure enough it was everywhere on all news forums. Gerald Crean arrested for plotting mass suicide Valentine's Day party. My friend from back home saw the news and called me, telling me I needed to call back to the Portland PD and tell them I called this in back in December. So I made the call, and about an hour later two FBI agents were coming to pick me up at my job, take me home, and were taking my entire computer to be analysed. We sat in my living room as I was questioned over and over about my involvement and if I was really planning to commit suicide. I kept telling them over and over that I'd just talked to the guy as a joke, thinking it was some sort of prank, and that I only called the cops when he started talking about some woman from Portland bringing her kids too. I said how I'd given all the info to the Portland PD officers back in December, and how was I supposed to know they'd never done anything about it, which they hadn't. They just sat on it, probably shredded it, and never even sent any of the info to Klamath Falls. The agent told me the story had gotten a lot bigger, and that Crean had contacted hundreds of people, and at least 30 had agreed to come on Valentine's Day to his house and commit suicide together. One woman's parents had found some emails between their daughter and Crean, and called the police, and that's how they finally got involved. Not from me nearly two months ago. This happened less than a week before Valentine's Day. I was freaked out as they dropped me back off at the college, and I told my boss everything that had happened. She told me that reporters had been calling non-stop since I'd left, wanting to talk to me, and she said she didn't give them my cell phone number, but that she thought it was only a matter of time before they showed up at the office. I was a student worker, and my name was on the campus website, directory, etc., if the AP got a hold of a police report, there was no saying how fast they could start tracking me down. I called my mum to tell her what had happened, and she told me she'd be up that evening to come and get me and bring me home for a break. I took four days off, turned in what assignments I had left, and the FBI had the rest of my tower. So I headed off to Eastern Oregon to wait out the media. Big mistake. Huge because by the time I made it back home that night, they'd already tracked down my brother and my sister-in-law, 
who'd thought it was so cool that ABC and CNN wanted to talk to me. They'd given them my parents' address and my cell phone number. They're idiots. I was harassed, chased down and semi-terrorized until I finally gave an interview to Good Morning America. I hoped it would die down then. The story was out, who cares? But I was wrong. Apparently every freaking outlet cared until you gave them the 15 seconds of conversation the others didn't get. I had my 15 seconds of fame, and I never want to deal with that crap again. Crean is still sitting in the Salem State Hospital for his crimes of solicitation to commit murder. Mr. Have you ever thought of suicide? Let's not meet in real life. I was working on Saturday in Tokyo as a private tutor for people whose native language is not English. One student I have regularly is a businessman in his late forties. I normally dislike Japanese businessmen, but he's always been very kind and seems genuinely respectable. One Saturday, we're in the middle of a lesson, when he suddenly began asking questions about my co-worker. I answered what I could about him, but I was a little confused as I didn't think this student had ever met with or had a lesson from my co-worker. When I asked why he was interested, he replied with the following. Because he keeps walking by and talking to someone, but I don't think it's a student because there aren't other students here right now. Is he all right? It's a little hard to focus when he's talking. But Saturday was Valentine's Day and my co-worker had not come in that day. Beside my students, I was alone in the building all day. I didn't see or hear anything for myself, so it kind of creeped me out. So this happened from 2007 to 2012. But the actual terrifying encounter happened exactly 2012, two years after my graduation. This horrifying encounter is still fresh in my mind today. But before we start with the story, let me tell you a short history about my father and his family's struggle in the early days as an immigrant in the US. Now my family currently lived in Pennsylvania, Lancaster. But before that, my father's family actually hailed from Romania, immigrating to the US in 1964. My paternal grandfather fled to the West during the last days of World War II, as he wasn't a soldier or a part of the war in any way. He was just a regular civilian, so fled to the West due to the widespread bombings in Bucharest. Their house had been severely damaged during an air raid in 1944, and luckily they survived. When he fled, he was already married and had one kid, who was my oldest paternal uncle, and they settled and lived in France for 19 years. My grandpa had several jobs to earn money, and my dad, along with his siblings, were born and raised there. By the time they'd finally immigrated to the US, my father was just five years old and was the fourth of five children. They arrived in New York penniless, and experienced being homeless beggars in the streets for days, until my grandfather, along with his eldest son, went into several jobs until they were able to make enough to rent an apartment. My grandmother also found a job as a cleaner in various parks and usually my father along with his two older sisters and his younger brother would go there to help her too. Once settled, my father along with his siblings would study and work and they were all able to finish primary and secondary education. My dad along with his siblings also studied college and were lucky enough to finish and find a stable job. My dad was planning on applying as a teacher after moving to another state, as that's what he'd studied for. But his younger brother, unfortunately, hadn't finished his education due to his vices, and instead of using his money to enroll in college, would use it to drink, buy cigarettes, and worst of all, do drugs. He would sometimes get into fights with his older siblings and my dad for allegedly stealing their cash to spend on his addictions. They felt sorry for him and forced him to rehabilitate himself for as long as possible, being released by 1981. Like he'd promised them, he had changed for the better by the time he was released and destiny gave him a second chance. 
He was able to find a stable job and meet a woman who gave him all the love and time that he needed. It would take years for my father and his family to find a comfortable life. My grandparents decided to move to Plattsburgh, with my younger uncle living nearby so he could be there if they needed him as they were elderly. My father would finally move to Pennsylvania in 1985, with his older siblings moving as early as 1983. He settled and lived in Lancaster, and he found a job there as a school teacher. Soon after, he'd meet and date my mother until they were married. So when I was a kid, the Romanian language was my first, and my mother was always busy with her work as a nurse in the local hospital, while my father worked as a high school teacher. I grew up with no siblings, so being the only child, it was so boring, as I didn't have anyone to play with. It took several years for me to fully understand and learn how to speak English, and it was really hard. During elementary school, I was a total loner, and was ridiculed whenever I tried to speak English, as I'd always stutter whenever I tried. I basically compared myself to an alien during my childhood, but thankfully my parents were always there for me and would stand up and protect me when I needed them. I learnt to just ignore the bullies after a time, as I just wanted to live in peace alongside them. And as time passed by, from fourth to sixth grade, I was finally able to make some friends. My parents had noted my advisor that I had troubles with communicating in English, and luckily my mother had a friend who was fluent in Romanian and volunteered to translate for free. So he became my interpreter until I was able to fully speak and understand English. My stress reduced, and my new translator was with me in school, helping me communicate with my peers. Now, during high school, my abilities to communicate and understand English greatly improved, and I was able to make friends easily. But I would still stutter sometimes, which would make some students laugh, inevitably. But I became a consistent honor student until I finished high school. Now the story. In 2007, when I was 19, I moved to Harrisburg to attend college there. I was there for four years, and due to privacy reasons I won't mention the name of the specific college I went to, but during my first month life was really good. I lived in a dorm along with other male students, and classes were busy, so it was hard for me to have time to check in with my parents or relax. I was feeling stressed and pressured at first, but I soon got used to it and was able to deal with my busy schedule. I came across some strange and weird people during my time there. Some funny, but some sketchy. But whatever, everyone's different. I made a lot of friends during my first year. One of them was Terry, who became my best friend. I also started to actively participate in school clubs and extracurricular activities, something that added to my social life. When visiting home and enjoying time with my family, We'd usually spend it studying and working on assignments, even over the weekends. By 2008, when I was a sophomore in college, I met this girl named Laura, who had recently transferred to the university. I met her when Terry and I went to the girls' dormitory to talk with his girlfriend, Christine, and Laura was Christine's roommate. During our stay there, Laura began asking me several questions like, do you have a girlfriend? She'd also said she'd like to date a boy like me, so I could tell that she was into me, but my main focus at that time was my studies. I made out to her that I thought she was joking, and I just continued to answer her questions as simply as I could without giving the sign that I was interested in her. I hadn't ever had a girlfriend up until this point, but was planning to get one only after I'd graduated, but that was a long way off yet and I'd heard that I'd been a main topic of discussion amongst Laura and her friends. As time went by, Laura started texting me as she was able to get my number from Terry. I'll admit at first it was hard to find time to talk to her, as I was so busy with my studies, but I'd lately realized that I should grab the opportunity, as Terry had told me that Laura was really into me. My next move would change my life. I began to text her back and we started talking on the phone. After that we started meeting in person until we started officially dating. 
She became my girlfriend after several dates, and during our relationship we both obviously obtained information about each other, as one does. We met every day, and her calls and texts would become more prevalent than usual. She also introduced me to her friends, who seemed to like me, and as time went on I got to know more about her. Unfortunately though, she began to become overprotective, and would get easily annoyed if I ever failed to meet her on time. At first it was nothing, but as time passed by I decided to take more time for my studies. At first she was upset, but the more I explained it to her the more convinced she was with my decision. Our relationship continued over the years without any conflict, but once we'd gotten to our fourth and final year of college, she changed a lot. She became extremely paranoid, doubtful and envious, and would start arguments in public, causing a scene. It was very embarrassing. I decided I needed to distance myself from her even more and focus more on my studies. However, one night while I was studying, I heard a knock on my door. My roommate was already asleep, so I assumed it must have been Terry. I opened it. I was wrong. It was Laura standing in the doorway, and she had a frustrated look on her face. She began asking why I'd started to avoid her, so I explained everything and she angrily left without saying a word. But I could tell that she hadn't listened to anything I'd said. One day as I was heading to my room after class, Laura was there and was vandalizing the place. She had written in big letters in red on the wall, You are going to pay for this. It almost looked like blood. I immediately got her out and she started to make a scene, but thankfully the school authorities intervened. Afterwards I explained everything to them, and it became sufficient evidence for Laura to be suspended for a week. My roommate and I were relocated to another room, since ours was trashed and needed to be cleaned up. However, the cleaners found broken glass under my bed, so now I knew that she'd had other bad intentions. After that, Laura started messaging me, and they ranged from explanations and wanting forgiveness to disgusting profanities. She'd even started threatening me, which I found deeply disturbing, so I finally decided that I'd had enough and blocked her number. But it didn't end there, and this incident really changed my view of Laura, and I'm thankful that I got to see her true colours shine through. After her suspension had ended, I broke up with her, she didn't say anything, but her face had drained of colour, and she didn't show for school for several days after that. I did apologise for breaking up with her, and felt sorry for her too, as she was obviously depressed because of it. But as time went on, I eventually saw her at campus, and she continued to attend classes as usual. However, when I did see her, she'd always be alone, so it got me thinking that maybe the breakup had affected her friendships too. I then began having her pour out her anger to me on social media. One time whilst looking through my page, I came across a post from Laura that showed my pictures with captions that had profanities that were intended to insult and defame me. So I reported the post and blocked her on Facebook. I'd really had enough with her immaturity and malevolent nature. After our breakup, I gained the courage to talk to Terry and my friends to try and reconcile with them. Our relationship as brothers had deteriorated when I started dating Laura, so I apologised to them. They accepted it and forgave and welcomed me back to the squad, when one day I asked Christine about Laura, and she said that Laura hadn't moved on at all, which made life unbearable for her. So she had to put in a request to change roommates. According to Christine, Laura's obsession with me was worrying. She'd become a prisoner of her own misery, and had changed a lot after the breakup. She would cry forever and would swear uncontrollably in the room. Laura had also started to show her darker side with her friends and would get into fights with other students. She would even make threats and talk about dark and creepy stuff which scared her friends beyond belief. Scratch marks would appear on her arms too, which made her friends think that she was going to kill herself. But any time they tried to comfort her, she'd become violent and start throwing things around the room. 
she was harassing Christine and her friends, which ultimately caused them to distance themselves from Laura, inevitably. All of this shocked me, and I hoped that she would stop what she was doing and change for the best. But I was wrong. She'd completely changed for the worse. I didn't hear much about or from Laura for a while. She didn't apologize to her friends and it actually seemed like she didn't even care about having friends at all. Months passed by and I finally graduated. I was able to erase all the bad memories and move on. After graduation, I decided to go back to Lancaster and start my new life. Most of my friends who lived in Harrisburg started their new lives by partying and some went on to vacation. Others who lived outside the city returned back to their hometowns where they celebrated their achievements with their family before they started the job hunt. Christine moved in with Terry and they lived in the suburbs of Harrisburg. I stayed in contact with my friends, but I didn't receive any news about Laura. I'd expected her to have changed and finally moved on by now. After summer was over, I started my job hunt like everyone else and I was lucky enough to find a stable job in my hometown where the salary was good, my co-workers were friendly, my boss wasn't a jerk and I'd easily got promoted due to my skills. I also decided to move out of my parents' house as I was able to buy a new house to live in and was looking to live a peaceful life from then on. However, one evening after a long stressful day at work, I was driving back home when I received a call from an unknown number. I picked it up, said hello, but there was just breathing coming from the other end. I hung up immediately, knowing it was just a prank caller, but once I was home, the same number was still calling, only for me to hear the same breathing. I blocked the number and went to sleep, and the following morning I saw something in the mailbox outside my house. Upon opening it up, it was a letter and it said, I don't forgive you and I don't forget, and it was written in red. It reminded me of what Laura had written on the walls all that time ago, so I threw it in the garbage thinking it was just a prank. Then one afternoon after my shift had finished and I had gone home, I saw this mail on top of my mailbox that said, You can't run, you can't hide, and you can't escape written in red again. I decided to ask my neighbour about it, and he said that he'd seen a car hours before pulling up outside of my house. Then they saw a girl get out and place the mail on the top of the mailbox. That's when my heart dropped. My mind was racing that night, and I had so many questions. I knew it was Laura, but how could she have known where I lived? I received a call from another random number, so I picked it up and heard a familiar voice. Go outside, I have a gift for you. It was Laura. I took a deep breath and went out, yelling and asking where she was, but I was greeted by an eerie silence, and not a single car or person was around. Then suddenly I heard a glass shatter behind me, and when I looked back I saw my front window had been broken. I was livid, and I knew it was Laura. I didn't care. I wanted her right there so I could confront her, but there was no sign of anyone anywhere. I began to make my way back into the house, when a rock suddenly hit me on the head that nearly knocked me unconscious. Then another rock, and another, and I could tell they were coming from the woods, which was very close and parallel to my house. I was now seriously hurt, so I dashed towards the front door and slammed it shut. There were pieces of broken glass on the floor, and also a brick that had a sign stuck to it saying, You made the wrong choice. I called the police and explained the whole situation to them, and before they turned up I decided to take a peek outside to see if it actually was Laura. I slowly opened my door, since it had no peephole, but was immediately bombarded with a brick, suddenly landing on my front porch. I shut the door and waited for what felt like an eternity, until the police finally arrived. I could hear them yelling at someone, and could see through the broken window that they were storming through the woods. 
After minutes of waiting, the officers knocked at my door, and I immediately opened it. They told me that they'd seen someone behind a tree near the side street before they'd gotten out of the car. This person was wearing all black and had dashed into the woods when the officers yelled at them. They chased after them, but to no avail. I told them exactly who I thought it had been, but they said that they couldn't just arrest someone without any real evidence. I gave them the brick with the sign so that they could turn it over for evidence, and they told me to call if anything else happened. Over the next few days, things were quiet. That is, until one Friday night, whilst I was watching TV. I heard a hard thud coming from my front door, and it sounded like a rock was being thrown at it. I opened the door only to find another brick with another note that read, I can see you. Looking out onto the street, there was this white SUV parked directly on the other side. I decided to confront whoever was there, but when I tried to look inside the vehicle, it had tinted windows, so I couldn't see anything at all. Was it Laura or someone else? I went back inside and closed the door, and as I felt sleepy I decided to turn everything off and go to bed. Sometime later, I woke up about 2.15am, and strangely the power seemed to be off. I knew this because my aircon was off and it was hot, so I went to find out if there had been a local blackout. It seemed that it was just me, so I made my way down to the basement to see what was going on. I had my flashlight, turned it on, and walked down the steps to the basement. On my way I noticed that both the front and back door were still closed, but my basement door to the outside didn't have a lock so someone could have broken in that way and turned the power off. I knew it must have been Laura, as I already knew that she was behind all the letters and notes, etc. I found the power breaker and switched it on. So now the basement was lit up for me to see that someone was hiding behind some boxes I had down there. When I saw who it was, my heart dropped. It was Laura, and she was wearing a white dress. Her face was unrecognisable and was covered in bruises. Her skin was pale and she basically looked like the girl from that movie, The Ring. This wasn't the girl that I met in college. My heart started racing as she smiled and asked, I want to be with you again, can we? I aggressively yelled, No, get the hell out of here or I'm calling the cops. She just stood there but then began to walk slowly towards me, whilst also looking into my soul. She pulled something from behind her back. It was a gun, and she tossed a box on the floor in front of me. It was all pictures of me from college, and they were now scattered on the ground from how she'd thrown the box. She admitted to breaking into my rooms on several occasions whilst in college, where she'd taken a picture of me while I slept. She showed it to me and said in a joking voice, You're such a handsome guy, but you wasted such a beautiful diamond like me, so I'm going to make sure that your life is going to be a waste too. She then teared my picture into pieces and aimed the gun at me. I managed to evade the shot that could surely have woken up my neighbours. Then I dashed upstairs and tried to lock the basement door behind me, only to fail as she fired another shot through the door. It almost hit me as I quickly dashed upstairs and back to my bedroom where I locked the door and hid in my closet. At first I heard her footsteps going room to room until it stopped at my door. She tried to open it but couldn't so she began pounding and yelling in a frantic voice for me to open up. Then there was a brief silence until she was able to use enough force to break the door down. She searched the whole room with her gun still drawn and luckily went straight past the closet where I was hiding. She now had her back to me, so I picked up my baseball bat that I had inside the closet and took a deep breath. I was able to quietly open the closet door without her noticing, then tiptoed silently out. Luckily she hadn't heard a thing as she just stood there staring at my bed. So before she could even stare back at me, 
I took another deep breath and swung the bat as hard as I could at her. It knocked her unconscious. Then I tied her up in a chair so she couldn't escape. I then called the police and took her gun. They arrived shortly after and entered my house, and by that time Laura had started to regain consciousness as she was handcuffed by the police. She was still threatening me and even tried to attack me on her way out, but she was tackled by the police officers and restrained. I pressed charges and she was declared mentally insane due to her behaviour in the courtroom. So instead of jail time, she served her sentence in a mental asylum. Laura apparently had a mental disorder that encompasses extreme obsession, which is dangerous when left uncontrolled. She went into psychiatric therapy during the course of her trial to determine if she was mentally insane or not. My family and friends obviously knew all about what had happened, and I recounted it all when I met with Terry and Christine in a bar. They'd expected this from Laura. She'd apparently gone missing for 12 days after the graduation, when her older brother began contacting her friends, including them, but no one knew where she had gone. Although one student had contacted her brother and said that she had last been seen in a bar drinking, which concerned her brother a lot, so he filed a missing persons report, but didn't receive any news after that. Apparently one morning though, she'd finally returned home crying, where she explained that she'd walked kilometers to get home and had slept in the streets for days. Her wallet had been stolen from the bar as she was drunk, and she arrived home penniless. Months passed by and her brother started to witness her strange behavior escalate, so he urged her to consult a psychologist. But she refused, and it resulted in conflict between them. After that, she left suddenly one morning without leaving any note. He began coordinating with the police to track her down, but all of their efforts ultimately failed. During her trial, Laura confessed in the courtroom that the firearm she'd brought with her that night was owned by her brother, as she'd stolen it from her brother's drawer whilst he was sleeping. She also admitted to being behind the phone calls, mails and the bricks being thrown at me. I recently found out that she was able to trace me by having some of my personal information from when we were still dating. You see, I'd given her my phone number and told her where my hometown was, since at the time I trusted her, obviously. So when I moved into my new house, she was still able to track it down by simply asking one of my neighbours if they knew me. And of course they did. So it was a piece of cake for her. Honestly, one small mistake that I made almost cost my life. Yet I am lucky enough to literally have dodged a bullet. From now on, I can't trust anyone easily, and I will always observe their behaviour and personality before I can fully trust them. I met a guy online recently that seemed sweet and kind. I decided to set up a date on Friday, and everything was going well. That is until yesterday. I get a message telling me that he wanted to hang out tomorrow morning, and I agree thinking that we should just go out for a Starbucks and he'd come around the time we agreed. I go to sleep with a smile on my face and instead wake up to a phone call at around 8am. Surprised I answered it and it's my date. Hey, you up yet? I just woke up. I don't care how you look. Also, your mum freaked me out. My mum? Yeah, she saw me park across your house. She waved and I waved back. She was kind of creepy. What time did you come over? 5.30 a.m. My heart sinks. I had no idea that someone I was casually meeting for coffee would show up super early to my house and wait for me to wake up. After the phone call, I check my messages. I see a message from 5 a.m., a picture of my house with the message, Do you live here? The next saying, Someone spotted me, so I moved, along with a picture of my neighbor's house nearby. Obviously, I was freaked out myself and knew that my mother and neighbors were probably equally freaked out. I began panicking and texting my friends on my phone, desperate to see if anyone else was awake and could help at all. I get one reply on a group chat, but out of fear of judgment, I lie to her, saying I had the situation handled and convinced myself to go out and confront this guy. 
Hi, princess, how are you? I noticed him on my neighbor's yard, probably trying to look for me in the window. Shaking, I try to fake a smile and let him hug me. He then goes in for a kiss, wet, messy and with tongue. I felt frozen on what to do. I tried to tell him that coming at 5am to wait for me isn't that cool, but he gives the excuse that he wanted to beat traffic and not drive sleepy as he works nights. I tried to see things from his perspective and shake it off. I get into his car and we go and have something close to a regular date, which usually doesn't include groping, licking my neck multiple times and talking about marriage right away so that I could have his baby. I managed to convince him to drop me off away from home and let me walk back to my house. That is until I realized he was following me in his car. And when I asked him about it, he asked if I wanted him to walk me to my house. Even more scared, I tell him no and manage to escape. By the time I arrive home, I'm in tears and extremely shaky. I text him that I don't think we're compatible and to never come near me or my family again. In response, he tells me that I'm the worst. From then, I take a break from online dating. This happened about six years ago. I'm 27 now. I had just gotten out of a three-year relationship that didn't end particularly well, and I didn't want to be one of those girls that made her way through a friend group, if you catch my drift. I wanted a change of scenery, so I decided to try my luck on a dating site called OkCupid. I know, I know, terrible idea, and I'm well aware of that now, but hindsight is always 2020. In my mind, most of the dating sites are a cesspool of incels, catfish or desperate people. But to my surprise, I actually went on several decent dates and had no red flags, creeper vibes or weird feelings. Luckily, I had made my mum aware of what I was doing. So whenever I'd go on a date, she'd know where I was and when I was going to be home. Mama didn't raise no idiot, right? Wrong. This is when I came across Dennis's profile. He seemed chilled, kind of cute and somewhat interesting, so I sent him a message. He was playful and had a sarcastic sense of humour, right up my alley, so I decided to give him a shot. We met at a coffee shop and had some very engaging and interesting conversation. He was 5'9", normal build and balding with reddish hair and glasses, and he definitely gave off some nerd vibes as he started off by asking. What are you looking for? I gave my normal response. I'm wanting someone who is sweet and caring, but also funny and intelligent. Something along those lines. Nothing groundbreaking, but cut me some slack, I was young. I realized later that giving this sort of response was the beginning of the end. Dennis and I went on a couple of more dates that were unmemorable, but I started to fall head over heels for this guy and fast. He was sweet, understanding, caring, empathetic, worked out and took care of himself, and was everything I ever wanted in a guy. It was difficult to understand why he was single. But since I was falling for him so quickly, we agreed that we would be exclusive. Everything was going smoothly until about two months into our relationship, and that's when it started to hit the fan. For the last month, I had been pushing him to let me hang out at his place and to meet his roommate, from the suggestion of my parents, because they're smart people. But every time I'd push the subject, he'd always make up some excuse on why we couldn't. My roommate is crazy. It's not a good time for him. He works opposite schedules to me, etc., etc. It was always something or another. At some point, we had made plans to go out to a club one evening, I was all dressed up and ready to go, and waiting on him. He ended up not answering his phone for a couple of hours, so I thought that his phone must have died, as whenever I would send him a message, it would never say delivered. I ended up deciding to go to his place to see if he would answer his door. I'd obtained his address at some point, I don't remember how, and he lived about 15 minutes from me, in an apartment complex. It was the middle of February and was ridiculously cold. I knocked on his door, but no answer. And whilst heading back to my car, look who decided to show up. None other than Dennis himself. And guess who he was with? 
Yes, you're correct, another woman, which I later found out was his long-term girlfriend, Jessica. I quickly made my way over to him, and the look on his face was absolutely priceless. His face deadpanned as soon as he saw me. He whispered something to the girl he was with, and she made her way inside. He then came over to me and was speechless at first. I'm very surprised to see you here. Really? We had plans, remember? I wanted to see if you were home. I do remember. My phone died, so I didn't receive any of your texts, and I lost track of time. We were at a friend's birthday party. Who's the girl? My roommate. I thought the guy was your roommate. He is. She's my other roommate and a very good friend. Mind you, I'm a very skeptical person, and alarm bells were definitely going off in my mind, in accordance with my parents' numerous warnings. However, Dennis was the sort of person who was very good at talking himself out of situations. His reasoning behind the decisions he makes, why he makes them, etc. He was an excellent liar, and being the naive and insecure person I was, I believed him. So we ended up going to the club after I waited for him outside in my car for almost an hour. I didn't think about it too much since I was getting what I wanted, and nothing was said about his girl roommate. Then over the next month, I kept pushing Dennis about meeting his family and his guy roommate. He eventually caved in and brought me to see his mother, which was an extremely odd experience. We talked about books and some of Dennis's friends, and I made some snide remark about how Dennis's guy roommate was nuts, his words, and they both gave me the strangest glances. This would make more sense to me in about a month or so when eventually I began to realize that Dennis's stories weren't adding up and there were numerous holes in them. He would only see me on Tuesday and Thursday evenings because he worked a lot of overtime and would never be flexible or change his mind or even allow me to attempt to change his mind. If he was late coming to see me, which started to happen pretty frequently, he would send me screenshots of his work and his work vehicle in line for getting a wash, or he would send me screenshots of his bathroom, saying he just wanted to freshen up. When I would ask for a picture of him in that moment, of him in his bathroom mirror, he would decline and refuse to send any pictures of himself, proving that he was where he claimed to be. He would also take unusually long bathroom breaks at my house after sex, like 20 or more minutes. I know, another huge alarm bell. Everything came to a head about a month or so later, when I told Dennis that I wanted us to go somewhere with no phone service so that we could truly spend time together without technology being a distraction. He agreed, so we ended up making plans to spend two to three days in Canada. It was still early in our relationship, four months, and my mum wanted to make sure I was safe, so she took down Dennis's driver's license and made a copy of it, as well as his license plate. Thank you, Mum. The trip ended up relatively uneventful, until the last evening in the hotel room, where I'm not sure if it was on purpose or if he was actually asleep, but Dennis ended up rolling over to my side, pulling me in close and saying, I love you, Jessica. That made my blood run cold. I was so upset. Tears started to blur my vision as I got up out of the bed. My parents were right all along. He was a liar and a cheat. But did I break it off? No, of course not. I was naive and desperately in love with him. I also didn't want to admit it to myself that I had been played or that I was the side chick. So I acted as if nothing was wrong and that I hadn't heard what he'd said that night. Of course, it didn't get rid of the aching feeling that I had for several weeks. I began to have bad anxiety and panic attacks because of the bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Dennis was constantly lying to me, and I mean constantly. It was so bad that I started to feel angry, and I let the feeling simmer for a couple of days until I decided to do something about it. When realizing that you were right all along, and things weren't just a strange coincidence, it's very bittersweet. On a freezing March day, after an exhausting day at school, I wanted to get rid of the nagging feeling in the back of my mind once and for all. 
I decided to head for Dennis's apartment complex to see if he was still lying to me about living in the apartments with his girl roommate. I got out of my car after parking, and I was shaking. I didn't know if it was from anxiety or from anger that was starting to bubble below the surface. Was he lying about this girl roommate? You bet your sweet ass he was. I knocked on his door and hid myself from the view of their people. He answered with his girl roommate behind him, and I came from around the corner to look at him with an emotionless face and said, Wow. I turned on my heels and walked away, only to find as I got back to my car that I'd locked myself out of it on a cold March day in the middle of winter. I was so distracted by my rage and sadness that I didn't realise I'd left both my keys and my phone in the car. I'm such an idiot. I was beside myself. I didn't know what to do. I'd locked my phone in the car along with the keys. I was so angry at myself for being such a moron. And not only that, I was in the parking lot of my cheating ex-boyfriend's apartment complex. I wish I was making this up, I really do. So with nothing else to lose, literally, I walked back to Dennis's apartment and knocked on their door. Jessica answered and I begged to use their phone to call AAA. Jessica surprisingly agreed and let me use her phone, and the entire time Dennis was agitated and was pacing around angrily after I'd gotten off the phone with AAA. At one point he even went outside with a coat hanger in an attempt to unlock my car, but to no avail. During that time I took advantage of being alone with Jessica to get some information out of her. Like, how long had they been together? Where had they met? I felt as though I was an auctioneer. I was shooting twenty questions at her rapid fire before Dennis came back in, and by the end of it had more than enough information to prove that Dennis was not who he said he was. Everything started to make sense and puzzle pieces began connecting. One of the biggest aha moments for me was when we were talking about being in a relationship with him on Facebook. It turned out this sly idiot had created two different Facebook accounts to ensure he was in a relationship with both of us on each of them, only to block the other girl on that account, guaranteeing that neither of us would come across each other or his other Facebook account. I remember in the beginning I commented on how his Facebook profile was really limited and didn't have anything on it, and he claimed it was only because he used Facebook to befriend co-workers on it and didn't use it for anything else. Near the end of our conversation, I tried convincing Jessica that Dennis was a pathological liar and didn't care about her, but it was at this point I realised that Jessica could have been aware of everything that Dennis was doing and was in on it, or she was just that naive. I tried texting her after I had left their apartment to try and talk some more sense into her, but it was useless. Dennis was with her alone and was a master at skewing and spinning stories. Unfortunately for him, though, I had one more trick up my sleeve. Over the course of the next week, I spent the remaining few free hours I had, if I wasn't studying or working, gathering evidence against Dennis. I did research on them both through Google, but mostly Facebook, and this is the scary part about Facebook if you don't have your privacy settings on lock. I found out who Jessica's parents were and decided to send them a message with all the evidence I had collected over the past week and a half against Dennis, ensuring that they would believe my story. Now, when I say evidence, I mean photos of him and I and screenshots of conversations we'd had through text, etc. And all of these pictures, texts, conversations had timestamps to show that he was seeing me at the same time he was seeing Jessica. I hoped they wouldn't write me off as some crazy ex-girlfriend or some psycho. Wishful thinking. I have copied it verbatim from the original post that I sent several years ago and have changed some information to protect my privacy and the privacy of others. Hello, Jessica's mom's name. My name is X and I thought there was something you should know. Your daughter is being lied to by her current boyfriend Dennis. I met him on an online dating site, OkCupid, and we spent the last five months together. But Dennis ended up lying to me about everything. 
and I doubt your daughter knows the extent to which she has been lied to. So I feel it is only right for me to share the information I have collected with you, so that it might be brought to your daughter's attention, so he can no longer get away with this type of behaviour. Dennis is not who he says he is, or appears to be, and has lied about many aspects of his life. For most of the information I give you today, I also have pictures as evidence, and for your convenience, to back up what I have to say. I will mention each time when a picture can be paired with information provided. First and foremost, a breakdown of the Dennis that I learned about while dating him for five months. Here I listed information and pictures with dates and information. As I stated previously, I met Dennis on OkCupid, an online dating site in early November. His online name was X, picture provided, which is also the same online name he uses for Flickr. We dated for five months until I found out that he'd lied to me about his living conditions, and the fact that he also had another girlfriend, your daughter. I have several pictures showing that Dennis and I were together as a couple. He also has several Facebook accounts, pictures provided. One he called a work Facebook, in which he was in a relationship with me on, and another account in which he was in a relationship with your daughter. His work Facebook account no longer exists, as he deleted it, but I was able to take pictures of it before it was deleted, to prove what I am saying. Before continuing, I should mention that I have met your daughter twice. The first time was very brief, and Dennis told me that she was only a good friend. They had just gotten back from hanging out with someone at Dave and Buster's for his birthday. This was back in early January. The second time meeting her was for a longer period of time. This was at the beginning of March. I ended up going to Dennis's apartment to see if he was lying to me about still living at the apartments, and he was. I ended up knocking on their door to find Dennis answering it and to see your daughter standing behind him. Jessica mentioned to me about how she and Dennis have been dating for almost four years. I was also made aware of another Jessica, her name is Jessica W, that he dated not too long before he started dating me. Jessica has also sent me texts mentioning that there may be a possibility of him seeing other women, aside from your daughter and Jessica, another different Jessica. I will attach separate files with all of the photos I have collected. They will be in the order in which they are mentioned in this letter to you. I hope this information is of use to you and I hope I was able to help in proving that Dennis is not who he says he is and for you to not be fooled like I was. Thank you very much for your time. Sincerely, X. I did end up receiving a reply from her mother the following morning. However, this post is already long enough, and I will post the responses if anyone is interested. But the last time I heard from Dennis, he'd left a message that he'd decided to leave in the grass in my backyard. It was a dead rabbit with its head cleanly cut from his body. It was clear that a human had done this, since there was no sign of blood and the head was cleanly cut off so my family and I reported it to the police, in case the situation escalated. Luckily it didn't, but unfortunately Dennis was smart enough not to take it any further, but it was clear he was very angry. He didn't want to leave any sort of trail, through internet or paper implying that he'd done it. My method of madness is to get my story out there, so that anyone reading or listening can know that your feelings are valid, and to listen to your gut. Ladies and gents, please be mindful and careful of who you become close with. The stories you hear on TV about people living two separate lives, or this wasn't the person I knew, are very much real, and they exist right under your nose. And to Dennis, I feel sorry that Jessica had to deal with your dumbass as long as she did. You're only sad that you got caught, and I hope karma plants you right on your ass. To all the ladies he has messed with, I hope you're okay, and that he hasn't dashed too much of your confidence. He's a low life, and that's all he'll ever be. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. To all my patrons who voted on Patreon tonight, I do apologize. Um, truth is, I am literally waiting for my Uber that is about to arrive in one minute and have to pick up my car from being serviced and 
because the Uber system is so rubbish out here, I was literally cancelled on three times in a row and then had to wait 25 minutes just to get one, I didn't have enough time to complete my recording. So the video that you guys voted for will be out tomorrow, really sorry. Huge thank you to all my members and patrons and names on screen, and of course to Miss Fearsome for joining us tonight. If you enjoyed her work, feel free to check out her channel, link on screen now and in the description. She creates some awesome content and I'm sure you guys will like it very much. That's it from me, Miss Fearsome's links on screen, and I'll see you all in the next one.